define what your values are, like whatever they are is for you as a human and make sure like that is the DNA of your company. Cause those are the people that are going to also, um, you know, you can't scale it alone. Whoever says they're, they're self-made, it's a big bag of bullshit, right? Like it's, it's you, you are the company you keep and the people is what makes your business successful. Welcome to reward the podcast of the trust. We are the show specifically for women entrepreneurs who want to build businesses into the multi-million dollar revenues and beyond, but especially because we know the reward is much greater than that. I'm Allie Brown, and I'm excited to introduce you to these diverse female leaders from a variety of industries, women making huge impact and who are unwilling to settle for the status quo. On the web, visit jointhetrust.org to learn more about our modern community for forward-thinking seven- and eight-figure women entrepreneurs. That's jointhetrust.org. See you there. Now, get ready to enjoy this episode's powerful conversation. You know, you sold your company. I expected to see you, like, on a boat or somewhere exotic. You're in an office wearing a jacket. What are you doing? What are you doing? Did you take any time off? I did take time off. I was, I'm working today and my work looks a lot different now, which is really exciting. However, I mean, I'm 35 years old. Like how much, like when you're done and you exit, it was such an amazing journey, building a company, taking it to record heights. And yes, there's a lot of amazing success from it. And I took the time. I did the traveling. I did all of the things I've been spending time with my family doing all of that. But there is like just always a fire in people, I think, like like us, like the type A's that we just can't sit still. And so after a certain point, you kind of get like tired of having an empty calendar. And uh, it's honestly more work not working. And so I have, uh, I am, you know, working on um, CEO school, which is something that I've had for the last three years. And so today we had amazing. Like we had our mastermind calls, we had coaching calls and just supporting women. And so like, now that I'm done with, you know, company number one, focusing on helping other women build their companies and it just fills me up and it it's work, but it doesn't feel like work. And so I get to choose, I get to choose what I get to do. And so that's why I'm in the office today. Uh, but don't worry, yeah. sometimes I do, I do uh, uh, work from <laughs> vacation. I'll be in Columbia all of next week, just hanging out with my best friend. And so we're doing plenty of that too. So work just looks a little different. That's good. And we do a blend. When when we have you at our meeting in September, you'll see it's it's a mix of a lot of business convo, but these women love to get together and relax and connect. And and we're, we're first of all, we're just so excited to have you at our meeting in September. Um you know, I know you do a lot of speaking, but to have this kind of access to you in uh, an intimate environment, you know, the whole story and how you built your company and sold it. I know these women are dying to ask so many questions. Why don't you give a brief overview today for all the people listening who may not know you that well on, you know, what, what, what your journey was like over the last, is it just probably about a 10 year span? Like when did you have the, have the idea to start yeah. uh, Stacks? It was exactly 10 years ago. So I actually launched the company in 2013 is when I put pen to paper on like the actual business plan. And then we were registered by March of 2014 with Visa MasterCard. Um, I'll sum up the last 10 year journey in two minutes if I can. Uh, So I, I was working in the payment card industry. I saw a need for, um, just better solutions and technology. And this is you know, 10 years ago, it doesn't feel, I mean, it's a long time ago, but it's like eons in technology, especially in fintech. And fintech wasn't even a, like a buzzword. It was credit card processing. And about 70% of the market was already on credit cards. And even a decade ago, we still, I don't know if you remember the signs on like businesses that was like, we don't accept American Express or no cards. I hated that. <laughs> yeah. And we were doing more right. and more cashless. That payments is something that was still really outdated and controlled just by the banks, and it was uh, it's a black box. It's expensive. It, you know, it's not transparent. And for small business owners, and I grew up in a family of uh, you know, I'm an immigrant kid. We grew up. I grew up working in small businesses that my parents owned, and so it was like a problem that I saw firsthand. And when I went to University of Florida, I was a degree. I got a degree in finance and marketing, and was such a data nerd. And when I understood that we have so much data flowing through that little black box at terminal, and we're actually not doing anything meaningful with that data to actually help grow the business. 
and credit card processing was just a commodity, saw an opportunity to say, how can we actually provide value to our customers? And instead of the nickel and diming, you know, move it to a SaaS, into a software, move it into a subscription model. And so, you know, lo and behold, we were the first subscription-based credit card processor that came to market. And it was extremely disruptive, very novel. And there was, there's a million scars on my back on like the stories that I could tell. And I think when we're in person, I'll get to share some of like the more intimate ones. I was one of your first customers, by the way. Well, not first, first, but if you remember when the name was Fat Merchant, right? I met you at an EY event briefly. We were both in the EY Winning Women. And I said, that's the model we need. And it was brilliant because I just saw it. It was like run by this like old mafia. That's what it felt like, like an old mafia that, that were still running things like it was in the seventies. That's what the, mer- you know, when you start a business and like, then you got to the merchant account thing. It was like, go to these three different organizations and you got to tie it together and you're charged by all of them. It was crazy. It's crazy. It was, and it needed true simplicity, simplicity from a model perspective. And then I think what really helped like grow the company was the um, you know, the technology as well. And like really understanding our customers, figuring out who our niche customers were. There was like Stripe and Square that were emerging in the marketplace, but they were focused on, Square was focused on, you know, uh, point of sale systems and direct, like small, like very yeah. micro, like small businesses, coffee shops, restaurant. Stripe was doing a great job, but it was focused on card not present. And there was this, this perfect niche of where we found this, you know, this, this spot where people needed both card present and card not present. So professional services, healthcare, field mm-hmm. services, and think about your, you know, your dentist, you go, you pay your copay, and then you got an invoice on the back end. So these businesses had to use QuickBooks for this and a reader for this and a terminal from Bank of America for that. And then Mm. an online checking account. There wasn't a solution that was just one that would integrate. So we developed the first API that did card present, card not present, all under a single token. Now I've become a technology nerd, but it was an amazing journey. Lots of hardship along the way. Um, I was told no every single step of the way. I didn't know how to go start this business. I didn't know where to go find Mr. Visa, right? It's not like it's opening up a um, e-commerce store or opening up a um, a cupcake shop. Not that these things are easy to do either anymore, but it was a regulated industry. And so I had a lot of uphill battles to go climb. I did, I've never built software, so I had to go find the right CTO and partners and you know, we did the thing and we built the thing. And 10 years later, I've now exited the company. Uh, we took it from, um, you know, from just that idea to processing over 40 billion in payments was like one of the last stat that I remember, uh, 400 employees. Um, we grew it, you know, from nothing to like 160 million in recurring revenue and, you know, exited at north of a billion in value. So we created yeah. a lot of amazing wealth for our employees, for our shareholders, and the company is still going. So like, you know, I am still a shareholder in the company and I'm still like a huge cheerleader and advocate. I'm always going to be its founder. And now I'm finding like this next chapter in my life. And it is I think it's so much harder. Like it's so much harder. I feel like it's just it's so much easier to be heads down building something. And then you look up and you're like, holy shit, like here we are now. Um, you know, you shoot to land on the moon, but like what happens when you actually land and like you achieve it? Kind of feel like they say they say there's like almost a grieving period after that. Was did you did you go through something like that? Oh my god, I'm still going through it. I'm like literally still going through it. I have more therapy hmm. than I've ever had. Um, no, it's exciting. I've had so much success. It's so great. Last year, we had like the big unicorn announcement. We did our Series D funding. It was a year before. And then it took me about, you know, I came back and I thought it was going to be this like, you know, you put so much pressure on the next milestone and the next milestone and the next milestone. And I think it was just like, you keep chasing and you get to a point like when I, when we hit the, we closed the funding, we hit the valuation, we got everything back. And then, you know, you know, my, um, got, I got my plan back from, you know, my board of like where we're going to grow. And it just was like, it's just another number now, right? Like I've already hit, mm-hmm. I've already accomplished all of the things that were on the list. Now I'm just going to raise the bar again from like a billion to two. And not that that's not like a crazy uh, thing to go do, but it just didn't feel at that moment, I was like, 
It just did not align with me wanting to spend the next five years going, you know, and building that. And there was so much sacrifice along the way. So, so much good, but, you know, I've, I've pretty much lost all of my, you know, like a decade of my life also building. And I had two babies along the way. And, you know, it was just like, I looked up, I took a sabbatical, I went to Europe for about six weeks and I came back and just like had clarity that I need to start succession planning and um, bring in, you know, another CEO. And I'm going to continue to be, it's like letting go of like your, like your baby is like grown and, you know, and built and it's done and now it's graduated. And, you know, it's like, I can't, you know, I yeah. can't, you know, I can't hold on to it like a baby forever. And so you go through this process and I think something that is like so frustrating to me with like, and I know you and I both are like women in business and I like, all I do is talk to women in business. And one of the things that I get so frustrated about is when people are like, well, it's, it's business. It's not personal. And I'm like, business is the most personal thing that I do. Like that is literally an extension of who I am. It's my values. Mm. It's my company. It's my people. It's the most emotional. And so it is personal. I built it. And so it was like, it's hard to also then let it go. And you, um, learn to, so there is a grieving process, but it's also like healing and it's great. And, um, now I am a recovering workaholic and, uh, I have some balance and it's been really great to <laughs> be back with the family and be able to choose how I spend my time now. But that's yeah. one of my clients, um, who just sold her company, uh, last year said, she said, it felt like sending my baby off to college. Cause like, you're still kind of part of the journey, but you're like, Oh, bye. <laughs> you know, and you're still, she's still, you know, on the board and, and all that, but it, it is, uh, yeah. She said, it's just, a, it's a weird trippy feeling at, at, you know, uh, something you said, I want to circle back to, because it was really something that stayed with me when I had you on my previous show, Glambition radio. And you were adamant from the start when you, you, here you were in this industry with outdated models, you were like locked in the 1970s financial matrix, right? And then you're like, you saw this escape hatch where everyone could go, but you wanted to bring your values with you even at that time, right? Then how you created this company and how you took care of your people. And I remember you talking a lot about that. Could you hit some of those points for those listening today about some things you wanted to do differently? in that company as you grew Absolutely. it? It's so important. It's so important to me. And I think that for many uh, founders and especially women founders, like values are like, that's what we keep with us. That's what we take with us. And um, I grew up in a family that had really strong values. And, it, you know, one of the biggest values, I literally have it tattooed on my arm. It's like my, my dad would always say one team, one dream, like it's one team. And I kept mm. saying we in the early part of my conversation, I built my company with my brother. And that was just such an, like a, we didn't intend to build it to the, you know, the height that we took it to, but we always knew that whatever was going to happen, we were, we were going to do it. We were going to do it together. We were going to, um, it was going to always be one team, one pot, one everything. And so that value was like one of our values at Stacks and was something that was so um, important on how we hired uh, and how we fired and how we brought customers. And um, every time I feel like I've, if I've, I look back and you think about mistakes that you've made or wrong people you've hired or things that could have gone differently. And you like, you look back and you're like, you knew it. Like you knew you had that feeling in your gut, in your body, in your heart. And you ignore those feelings because it's like, you know, there's that, you know, you're trying to get the business or you're just trying to make it, you're trying to do what you think you're like rationalizing what is happening internally with your gut and your heart. And, mm -hmm. and we look back and you're like, if I just had stayed true to like, I already knew it. I knew it in my gut that that wasn't the right person. I knew it in my gut that that wasn't the right partner or vendor or whatever that is. And so, you know, define what your values are, like whatever they are is for you as a human. And make sure like that is the DNA of your company. Cause those are the people that are going to also, um, you know, you can't scale it alone. Whoever says they're, they're self-made, it's a big bag of bullshit, right? Like it's, it's you, you are the company you keep and the people is what makes your business successful. And so mm -hmm. I know there's been a million Ted talks on this, but I've, I feel it firsthand. Um, your values are super important. Make sure that your people have those values and that that is the company DNA that will serve 
you know, your company's success for, you know, and be your legacy for years to come. I remember you, you were paying a lot of attention also to, you know, the women on your team in the company and making sure that things were set up in a way for them to succeed extraordinarily well, it seems, from what you shared. Yes. Um, you know, for me as a woman, a woman of color too, I mean, I was fundraising while I was pregnant. I think we probably met at EY. I was like, had just given birth to one of the babies. I don't remember what year, probably Anna. Um, and it's just, the world is such a boys club. I was so over the boys club. I'm still so over the boys club. Well, especially financial. I mean, it's extraordinarily weighted that direction, right? Extraordinarily. And you're told how to run. Like, I almost felt like the success of my company finally came when I was able to truly just like stop trying to be somebody I'm not. And for the first five years, probably of me as CEO running the company, I was just trying to please everybody else and like how I should be as a CEO. And when I finally was like confident in my own ability to say, no, I actually do know what I didn't go to CEO school, right? Like I, and I always, you know, I didn't have that, I don't know why I needed that validation, like who I needed that validation from. And, you know, when I trusted myself and I made the decisions, I got myself, I, I'm a great problem solver. I'm a great visionary. I can go drive the people to do what we need to do. Like I have so many amazing abilities, but I didn't have the confidence in myself to just not have that like perfect validation because everybody that was in the venture backed community, all the other portfolio CEOs were Harvard this or had all the, I didn't have any connections. I didn't have, like, it was just different for me. Mm. And I felt like I was judged, you know, all the time. Um, and especially like when, um, you know, when it came to family life and I would hide, um, like, you know, I didn't take maternity leave and I like hid my pregnancy for as, like as long as I possibly could, because I didn't want, you know, investors or, uh, people to doubt like what was, you know, how I would show up post, um, having a baby. And it was really hard to try to be freaking everything all the time. And then have this, like, you know, this, this, this armor on. And I think that like, I think it was COVID and, um, you know, when the pandemic hit and everything was, everybody was in lockdown and everybody was telling me what to do. There was so much advice. And for the first time, because it was it was all about like, there was, the world was in an actual crisis. Like we had no idea what was going to happen. People were dying by the numbers. It's like, I don't care. Like my people matter to me the most. And like, I do not care about anything else. This is how we're going to operate and handle whatever's coming. And every decision that I made was the right decision for that comp for the company. Mm. And I don't know. Because where you that made it right. Yes. And I you think made the decision. motherly instinct of like, I don't care. Like now it's fight or flight. And I, I didn't, and I, I hated that it took that level for me to feel that, like to, for me to feel it, but I never went back. And I'm so grateful for that. And that was like our, you know, we scaled, like we had our best years through the pandemic, scale the company, take it from like a hundred million in revenue to a billion in, in wow. value. Um, like it was, it, it was a journey. I've learned a lot. Um, and now I'm just trying to support as many women as I can so yeah. that, they feel that they can do this too. Like it, cause she can. I love, I love that. You know, d the last several years, I do think that time, it was such a wild west that it was a new situation that none of us had dealt with. Right. It hadn't been around since like the plague, I think. Right. Something like that, <laughs> that monumental and all these leaders, there's all these advice and you see people doing things differently everyone had no choice but to go through that in the way that they thought best and how to lead their company and work with their customers and do what they thought was right. And so isn't that interesting that that kind of jump started what you feel as like the, the you never looked back from that past saying, you know, I, I know what is best now and how I'm leading this company. And then look where it just took you in the last few years. Absolutely. Um, I'm so grateful. And you know, you learn a lot and there was a lot of mistakes that I've made along the way too. And those are the things that I want to make sure that, you know, I, I didn't know, right. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know your blind spots. And, um, now you get to do it again and do it in the way that, you know, with experience. And if, so it's, it's exciting times. I'm figuring out like the next, uh, path now. And I'm just focused on scaling CEO school and supporting women there. And, 
I think uh, probably by uh, next year, you'll probably see me working on another tech platform. So that'll end up. <laughs> I love it. I'm so excited you're going to be joining us in September. And for everyone listening, it's September 12th and 13th uh, as part of the Trust, which is our network for seven and eight figure women entrepreneurs. Sunira is coming in as our special guest advisor. And we. this is like the best part of the meeting because someone like you, Sunira, comes in and we're all just sitting around and like, it's like having a boardroom of these incredible women listening to you, hearing your advice, being able to ask you questions, you know, for everyone listening today, if you can give a little insight and maybe into some of the things that you'll be, you know, sharing or expanding on when you have time with us. Yeah. I mean, I know we have our, our like call scheduled and I'm such a big believer in, in community and support. And I'm so excited that you are bringing the women together in this setting. And, you know, one thing about me is I don't gatekeep. And that's like one of my biggest frustrations about like when I'm, uh, when I meet mentors or when I, or when I meet people that I like look up to, like, I think the only way that we win is if we win together. And so if I can be of help in someone's journey and say, you know, you know, this is who I use and this is the contact that did this. And this is the playbook that worked. And this is how I thought about it. And these are like the most dumbest mistakes that I made, right? That would be, that's my goal is to leave the women with um, the knowledge that they need to actually apply the principles uh, to scale. But some of the things that we'll, I'll be talking about in my keynote will really be around the concept of, for me, I had to call it freedom of time and freedom of dollar both. And I, for the last decade of my life, um, you know, when you st you're an entrepreneur, or you start a business, um, you start it to, to um, have that freedom of dollar and that freedom of time, and you end up mm. not having either. And then when you do get that freedom of dollar and you're getting that, then you lose that freedom of time. And so I feel like, you know, a lot of my learnings and the things that I've like, wish I like not necessarily go back and do a redo, but it's, it really is about like enjoying the journey as well. And the, you know, so focusing on freedom of time is, is just as important as freedom of dollar and freedom of impact as well. So I'll be talking about how we can mm. actually, you know, like earn more while doing less. And I think we've, you know, you know, if, as women, we've like always had to fight for our spot and work harder than everybody else. And so we're so used to always being behind that we have to like, we have to, we're always working harder. And so I really want to, you know, inspire the women to really think about and have some processes on, you know, how I, what I do, what I delegate, what I delete, and just like owning my time yeah. back. I take Fridays off now and I like, and all of these things were possible and what, like, even while I was CEO. And so it's yeah. not now I have the freedom of time, right? I had that. I, I had those opportunities. I could have done that. And so that, that was a value were, you built into your company and how you worked at the company. That was the value that I had for everybody else. I didn't apply it to myself, right? Because I had, I put all that pressure on me and I look back mm -hmm. and, and it's not that I couldn't have done it. And so in this next chapter, I'm like super focused on my boundaries and super focused on doing things that align. But that is the thing that I'm going to be talking most about is how to get that during that process, right? And how we can define yeah. those things because it won't change the outcome. And I do it every day for the women at CEO school and everyone is earning more while doing less and doing the things that they love. And so really focusing on the journey and freedom of time um, and freedom of impact as well. And, you know, you deserve to have it all, whatever all looks like. I'm so freaking tired of people saying like, you know, I have like, I do too much. Like I do. I like it. I have a podcast. <laughs> I love CEO school. I built CEO school. You are being Why? you. And that's what we love. We brought yes. in so many different, uh, you know, it, it, the, the, one of the most enjoyable things to me is about bringing in all these different special guest advisors and women who have built these huge, you know, just multiple nine figure companies and just it, everyone does it differently. And we need to remember that and honor that. And I think, you know, in the old model, there was one way to do things, right? Mm -hmm. I think you said the stale male and pale model is what you used. That term you used much. You, you've used that a few times. Um, and then to see women do it. <laughs> no, nope. exactly. You were saying like that was no. the model that you were fighting against in the financial yep. industry, right? That's the old way. 
And then now though, each of us is bringing in our own way of doing things and they're all different and, and they're all amazing to learn from. And so we're so excited. Last question for you, Sanira. Uh, the name of the show is called Reward because for us in the trust, we talk a lot about the reward of all this beyond the revenues, you know, tell me in, you know, your own words, you know, what is the reward of all this for you? Oh, the reward of all of this. Oh, there's so many rewards. Um, I would say it's the biggest reward is impact. Like I truly like feel, I feel so lucky and so privileged and so blessed to have like a, I built it through hard work. It wasn't luck, but I do feel so privileged to now have like what we've done and what I've been able to do, but to use that to really inspire the next generation of women is so important to me. I'm a, I'm a, I have two young daughters. Mm. Today was first day of school. I was literally, I'm a hot mess today. My youngest went to pre-K and Aww. it, I, and I, I do see like there, I mean, there's such a gap that is there for, you know, for women today, even though there's so much dialogue around it, still less than 2% of female founders break a million in revenue, right? And the gap is even further for women of color. And as a woman of color, as a, you know, a daughter of an immigrant, like this is, I, I never knew, Ali, that I could go build a million dollar business, let alone a billion dollar business. And if I had seen somebody that looked like me, that like, shared their journey, like maybe I could have seen that. Maybe, maybe I could have been like, I mm -hmm. can do that too. And so I feel the most privileged. Like that's why people are like, why are you, why are you not on a beach? Right. It's because that isn't my purpose. Like that, this was just chapter one. And now my purpose is to share this and to inspire and to, and to hopefully see the next generation of women, you know, at the top, like when, you know, um, like who wants to be a, like a, a unicorn by themselves, right? Like I want to see other people alongside. And so honestly, like, this is what I feel the most privileged and the most, you know, um, the reward is it's not just yours. It's seeing other people's success too. I love that. Well, you're going to meet some extraordinary, <clears throat> excuse me. You're going to meet some extraordinary women with us in September. We're so excited to see you in person. And uh, everyone, if you're listening, if you do run a business in the seven and eight figure range, join the trust.org. Come join us. And Sunira, thanks for your time. I'm so excited to uh, see you in person again and have some great conversations. I'm so excited to meet everyone. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Subscribe now to the Reward Podcast to be sure to not miss an episode. And don't forget to visit jointhetrust.org to learn more about our modern community for forward-thinking seven- and eight-figure women entrepreneurs. You can learn more, apply to join us, or refer another woman you know who is over the million-dollar mark and is ready for a different type of women's network. We have events coming up both live and online that are truly creating new possibilities for female leaders. That's jointhetrust.org. See you there.